Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this cultural and civic engagement session. Uh, my name is Ronan. I'm the curator here at Change Now. Uh, so in charge of uh, all the works of art uh, that are around here, I uh, invite you to raise your eyes to the sky. And maybe you'll see some of them. Uh, I'm very honored to be also the MC of this session uh, about cultural and civic engagement. Uh, we will hear five visionary guests uh, who will share with us their methods and their ideas and their visions uh, to build a more sustainable society uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and a more sustainable democracy, perhaps, uh, with art. So um, the social and environmental transitions are uh, necessarily linked and correlated to global cultural transitions. Um, so history has proven that cultural revolution is kind of a dangerous uh, chemistry, not to put in everyone's hands. So how do we make sure that artists and cultural institutions contribute to empowering any and all citizens um, to build spaces for both alterity, but also unity, and to foster um, a, a public debate, maybe a healthier public debate, and down the line, a stronger democracy. So with our uh, five fantastic guests, let's explore what engagement means for them and for you all. Uh, so to navigate, uh, I don't know if, if she's online already, but to navigate uh, these uh, vast topics of engagement, uh, we need stars, uh, constellations, just like the ones in the, in the blue sky of the Grand Palais Ephemer. So our pole star tonight, uh, to, today, <laughs> tonight, uh, will be Esme Ward. Uh, Esme Ward, are you, are you here? Ah. So, Esme Ward is the director of the Manchester Museum, uh, and she's leading a methodic revolution in this university museum uh, that is going to reopen at the end of the year. She's basically turning her museum into a, a kind of house of commons. Um, Esme Ward has dedicated... Oh, hi, I see you now on the screen. <laughs> Uh, Esme Ward has dedicated her whole career to creating value for public service, taking into account all differences, and maybe we can dig deeper in, into, uh, into those programs, uh, all differences including age, psyche, cultural backgrounds. And uh, so th thank you so much, Esme, for joining us from Manchester. We hope you recovered well from COVID. And, and, and fully recovered now. Uh, so the floor is yours for the next uh, four or five minutes, and then we'll have a little chat. Fantastic. Thanks so much. It's wonderful to be with you all. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. And to share our work at the museum, the UK's largest university museum. Sorry, in, Esme. Uh, I I don't know if you tested this, the sound before. It sounds like it's... it's. Uh... I did test it, yeah. yeah. I can hear an echo. You can hear an echo. And there's a little delay. <laughs> can, can I get a, a signal from the technical team? I mean, it would be a pity not to hear, not, uh, to hear only half of what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> can we can we improve uh, the connection the somehow? Connect, 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 connect. Hi. It's can you try now? I'm I'm think it's echoing on the side. <laughs> oh, technology. <laughs> I don't quite know. Ha. Huh. That's it's no better. I'm I'm gonna see with the with the team if we can do something. 
Apologies, folks. Ah, that's such a pity. Uh. Can you close other tabs? Anyone in the in the public has a solution? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, can you can you try putting earphones and connect it to your uh, computer? It. This is Open Innovation Live, so it. I'm counting on you guys. Okay, I will try. What? How about this? So maybe I'm gonna start uh, asking you questions so we can test out if this works better. Uh, I, I wanted to know more about the Hello Future uh, program that you're launching for the reopening of the museum. Uh, can, you, can you tell us what it, what it looks like concretely uh, implemented in your museum? And now I you can, can try. Is this what to be honest, not much. No. Ah, can we can we try a phone call? We have the image with the connection yep. and the and a phone call. Can we can we try to do this? It's funny because the, the the revolution that you are that uh, you are leading at the museum is a very local one, and you you mentioned that. Uh, the purpose of a museum is to, to, to serve the locals and to serve the Mancunians uh, in, in Manchester, of course. And now we're being, uh, we're being stabbed by technology. <laughs> okay? Because, uh, Esme, we're going we're gonna to retest the connection and I'm going to uh, jump to the, to the panel because all of my uh, uh, panelists are here. So I'm going to invite you, uh, you all, Magda, Nathalie, Chris, if you can up, go up on stage. And we're going to start the panel. So what do you want to As you want. Please, just grab a seat. You can't go you have what you want. So, thank you for being here. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to introduce you a little bit. Nathalie, you're back from Quebec, uh, where you've uh, uh, headed the, uh, the Montreal uh, Museum for 13 years, or about, yep. about 13 years, um, and implemented Inclusive innovations, and one of my favorites is, of course, the, the museum prescribed by doctors. Uh, so museum tickets uh, on a prescription. Uh, and now you, di you direct the museum and collections of IMA uh, in Paris, the so Arab World uh, Institute. That's right. Um, and it's a, it's a cornerstone, for those who don't know it, it's a cornerstone for uh, French society, ab about diversity and, and unity of, of French society. Magda? Hello. Uh, you're, uh, hello. You're a super active or super activist uh, gallerist. Um, so you have galleries in Paris, London, Shanghai. You specialize, but not only, in street art. And you represent artists like Futura, Vils, JR, Robert Montgomery, Liu Bolin in China. Uh, and your artists, of course, show their work in galleries, in museums, but on the walls, outside, in the streets. Also at Natalie's. And yes. also, <laughs> also at the, at the email. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so indoors and outdoors. And you're currently uh, curating Urban. Uh, in north of France, uh, an exhibition about the place of women in public space. So, uh, our last guest, Chris, should I welcome you here, or are, is it you welcoming <laughs> me? Cause I, I, no, I, I think you should yeah. welcome me, because <laughs> every, every time I come here when there is another event, I barely recognize it, and I must say, this is absolutely looking fabulous. 
So, uh, but I didn't know where I was because it changed <laughs> again. So, <laughs> congratulations. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, thank you. I mean, thanks to the whole Change Now team. It's a, a few hundred people uh, working on this. Uh, so, Chris, you are the boss. You are the head of the RMN uh, GP. So, I will head try to the define. RMN. What is that? It's uh, called the uh, the association, the French Association of National Museums. Okay. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very peculiar organization because yes. it goes back all the way, even to the beginning, to the end of the 19th century. And uh, for instance, one of the, the things we have been running since then is the museum shop of the Chateau de Versailles. So we do all these kind of things, uh, which, which are really very, very important for museums today. For museums, for, for national collections, and we're going to talk about the, the purpose of, a, of an institution, and maybe uh, talk, uh, talk about that. But I wanted to ask you a, a, a quick one first to, to, to introduce, because you are all three uh, amazing curators. Um, what is, according to you, the superpower of an exhibition? Huh. Superpower of an well, exhibition, I mean. I, I think, first of all, it's sharing. Um, and I think we have to cut back with the myth of the, at least contemporary artists, sorry, there's not only contemporary art, but in my field, that the artists are um, artistes maudits, as we say in French. They work alone in a studio, cut an ear, and then become famous once they're dead. Uh, no, uh, what they do is to raise a voice, and that that's exactly what we're here for. Um, and an exhibition and being curators are, is mainly about putting a story together, their stories, and giving it to the world. I think that, that's already a big power they're, they're giving us. I feel very blessed that they're giving us this chance. So you're powerful by proxy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Nathalie, you want to say that? Yeah, for me, I would say that uh, a good exhibition, on my point of view, is an exhibition which is relevant. So uh, all kind of uh, subject can be ch uh, chosen, but this subject uh, should be relevant with uh, our days. Uh, even if we have an old master's uh, exhibition, of course, donc, uh, we know that with a decolonial perspective, donc we can reinvent uh, a new vision about our old history. So uh, it's all about uh, cancel uh, context culture instead of uh, cancel culture. Uh -huh. Context culture. We, uh, do you want to develop about uh, context culture? Because you, you obviously you, you made the travel from North uh, America, <laughs> and now you're heading this kind of pivotal uh, museum uh, that is the Institut du Monde Arabe. What did you learn from those uh, transfers? Well, I'm always learning, obviously. Uh, it's true that now, donc, with our global perspective, uh, we have to understand each other. And uh, one of the main pro uh, issue is the language, the vocabulary. Uh, sometimes we want to use the same concept uh, or a different, uh, the same word, but it does not mean exactly the same thing in an Arabic word or in Spanish or in French or in English, obviously. So I would say that uh, the, uh, we have to um, uh, make an uh, adequation between donc, uh, all uh, this lexical issue uh, especially when we are talking about communities, multiculturalism, uh, workism, etc., etc. So there are all kind of concepts which are uh, imported from here in France from uh, the uh, anglophone and especially American world, and we do not understand them in the same way. So uh, it is important to uh, uh, keep calm and uh, just uh, <laughs> to find the uh, common language. Okay, good. It's a good. <laughs> it's a, it's a good advice. Keep calm with wokeism. <laughs> <laughs> Obama said this too. <laughs> I like Obama. <laughs> um, and 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 you, uh, uh, Chris. Oh, you were asking about yep. you know the notion of the curator. What does it mean to curate an exhibition? Yes. As, as you know, the word curator is a very old. Old term. Mm -hmm. It's coming from the Anglo-Saxon Church. The curator of the Anglo-Saxon Church 
in the 16th century was the guy who counted the bones of the saints, the relics, in the morning at 4.30, and he counted them again at night to see if they were all there. <laughs> he had to lit up the candles, had to blow out the candles. That's where the word curator is coming from. For me, the word curator means to You don't identify. To take <laughs> care. Yes. Okay. Yes, we are like them. We <laughs> like to take care. Care of the works of art care of the public because something has changed of course today we stand of for the art of with art with the public as you know the salons of the 19th century and many exhibitions we have seen even until recently is about are about separation art public now we have to connect them we call it plus art plus public public plus art that's what curating means okay. i mean if you ask what an exhibition means that's something else, because for me, you have necessary exhibitions and unnecessary exhibitions, but that's a completely other subject. Well, Kay. it's true that, uh, in fact, we change from a conservation point of view to a conversation point of view. It is not that we are forgetting the first aspect, but we are enriching it with our public. I do agree completely with uh, Chris. Mm. Wha what, what is the subject of this conversation? Uh, and how do you make uh, the collections relevant? You said you had a, a, a purpose and that uh, the association, uh, MNGP, uh, is, uh, has a, a very old purpose. How do you make it more relevant for now? How, d how do you update it? Or do you have to update it? I mean, I can quote a colleague who is brilliant. His name is Eric de Chasse, who said to us, to the association, uh, recently, a necessary exhibition uh, is about pleasure. Pleasure. It's also about citizenship, uh -huh. the conversation Natalie is talking about, and it's about the care, the care for the works of art. They really have to be there, but there has to be a person, a purpose, and a person, but a purpose for them being there. And that's the definition, could be a definition of a necessary exhibition. I like to say that today it's wonderful to make a thing called an exhibition where the public is strolling around and is wondering why is that work <laughs> combined with the other work. And then the second question is, why am I as a visitor here? And that's a, an incredible philosophical question. Why, for God's sake, I'm here? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, and, and, and you, Magda, um, so you also have an institution, it's a, it's a gallery, uh, you exhibit. What, uh, what, conversation, uh, are the, are the, what conversation are made with the within the public and, and uh, the works of art that you uh, exhibit? It's a work on the everyday basis and because we are much smaller than all the museums you guys represent, um, it's also a chance because we get to see on an everyday life every single person who gets in. We could do our trading part, our dealing part, privately. I mean, actually, would probably be easier even. Uh, but that's not the reason why the artists give us the artworks. We are producers. We think with them, like, OK, how do you want to address the public? Um, then hopefully sometimes we go <laughs> and show in your places both um, and, and, and can enlarge this public. But it is key to be able to bring dialogue, because we're not here to do the explanation, because if words were more accurate, they would be writers. <laughs> the images or whatever they produce have this power. And today, in this dialogue you were talking about, that is so key. And taking care of the public, that's why, as galleries, we are open eight hours a day, f at least five days a week. We are even open on Sunday these days. So. Because we, we, we have this mission to, and it, it looks really strange because we're private institutions, we're private corporations even, but still, I mean, that's where, where it makes a little difference. During COVID, when all the institutions were, I mean, during the lockdown, uh, when, because we're still under COVID laws, uh, but uh, when lockdown was at, at its strongest, um, institutions were closed, but galleries were open. Did, did uh, it depends. It depends? No, not really, no. Okay. Uh, auction houses were open at some point uh, in, uh, in the third lockdown, but we did not manage to defend our rights well, okay. obviously. Um, but still, I mean, special. And, and having a gallery in Shanghai, th these days were closed yes. uh, under hard lockdown. Um, it's tough, but it's tough for the public 
and the creators. And that's why I like when you, you say we're at a crossroad, we're at a conversation now that we see we, there is this need to, to have a stage. Um, and when, it, when it's missing, it's a big problem, not only for the present time, but for the future, because it's that much project that do not get mm. to be made, that much questions that are not addressed, uh, and maybe that what makes us human, that we need to dialogue I mean, and enjoy things, and maybe just for pleasure, which is good also. Not everything has to be intellectual and super activist. Mm -hmm. Ple depends, pleasure, depends, pleasure, but pleasure is also a form of engagement. It is, but it but is. Where I slightly disagree with Natalie is that an exhibition today can never, ever be neutral anymore. So when you speak about can cancel culture, that's one of the extremes. But I think we have, when we are obliged to take in positions. For instance, if uh, 10 years ago we would not have said to each uh, other, at least half of this exhibition has to be art by woman artists, nothing would have been changed. If we would not have said two years ago, during Black Lives Matter, we're going to look in all these artists who are making work but have been overlooked, then things would never have changed. And that's something else than selling a work of art, because today you have a complete schisma between, I would say, judgment, call it societal judgment or aesthetical judgment or whatever, and financial judgment. I mean, we know, both of us, we know these people who are not interested in judgment, they just, you know, sell one to the other. It's also called NFT, uh, but we are, we are there to speculate on judgment. And <laughs> judgment is one of the most beautiful things in the world when you can say, this is necessary, this is not necessary. This is better than that. And that's, I think, also something which has to do with citizenship. In fact, I just want to uh, answer, obviously, because when we are talking about uh, context culture, it's not, uh, the position is Cancel not to be Cancel our context culture. Uh, oh. Can't cancel culture, okay. Okay. for me, uh, is a position which divides. Uh, okay. It's uh, very activist. I like that. And in fact, uh, it's essentialized uh, mm -hmm. okay, some positions. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the position, and I did work so much about togetherness and about debating instead of struggling. Uh, I think that sometimes, and because uh, I I used to live you know, many, many years and uh, many decades uh, well, in Canada and North America, and I can see the limits because sometimes uh, with this uh, approach, uh, is, um, it's a little bit too uh, narrow-minded. Now, of course, don't, uh, working at the Arab World Institute, uh, don't, uh, we, we should be, it's also a very activist institution, so it's not a question of being activist, but how do you want to be activist when you are an institution? Because you do not want to talk to just a part of the society. If we want to respect the democracy where we live, we have to uh, respect all kinds of opinions, not in the way that we uh, agree with different opinions. All opinions? All opinions? Not because we agree with all opinions, but because we want to find the right. line which will be heard. And in fact, this is much more complex. It's very, very complex. For example, look, uh, uh, at the uh, Institut du Monde Arabe uh, right now, look, we had this exhibition about uh, Jews of Orient. Look, uh, in the uh, Institut, it has been a great success and uh, we had to be very subtle. Next uh, fall, look, uh, there is a project uh, uh, I like very much, I'm pushing. Uh, it's all about the LGBT um, um, art yeah. in the Arab world. So, of course, look, uh, there it We're is Playing with fire. No, I think that I don't like that. I, uh, I'm much more peaceful. I, I much prefer to, to find on the, uh, uh, as would say Obama, the love is love um, uh -huh. uh, sentence. And in fact, the relevancy will be without aggressivity. Uh, and I think that uh, it's, uh, it is a, the good way. But this is my personality and my character. And, of, and I respect so much uh, associations because their role is to be activist and our role as institution is also to be activist but also with a more inclusive way. I, ha I have, I have a, a question for, for you, Magda, because we talk about 
activism, maybe about active citizenship. You're not, you don't have to be an activist. You can only be just active as yeah. opposed to passive. Um, but Magda, uh, Chris said that uh, all exhibitions needed now to be or were by default engaged. Your exhibition, Urbain in Ube, um, about the, the place of women in, in public space, you decided that you should not only invite uh, women artists. Why? No, and it was a request from the institution at first. And I was like, what? Why? No. And it's not talking only about the place of women, because there's not one form of engagement. And the artists were even relieved when I asked them. They were like, hopefully we're not going to talk only about street art, which as insiders to the movement, we hate the word. I'm very glad because I use the word contextual art. That's probably why they are engaged, because they work in the context. They're in the street, so they hear what is here, what is there, and they respond, in a way, to the context. And also, they were telling me, the artists, like, it's not just the subject is not the place of woman, is woman plus religion, or woman teaching craftsmen, for instance, for an Indonesian artist we invited, or woman and migration for uh, two uh, Icy and Saad, two irony brothers who fled their country. It's also leaving your mother who's telling you, mm. if you want to be artist, you have to go away. I mean, women are at the center of many, many, many other engagements. You and also invited Kubra Academy, who was yeah. on the previous panel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, who is going to add a little work to, to the show. It's an ongoing dialogue. And I think we have, uh, as cultural actors, to open wide answer to the context. But I agree uh, with you, Chris, that we cannot remain passive anymore. It's not, it, it's impossible. I mean, and, and we've seen the change. We had, and even in, the, in this little field that is street art, we had like getting up, as we say, in the 80s, putting your name in big colors, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Now it's something else. Now it's really mm -hmm. context response. I think that in fact we're never passive because uh, well, we should be uh, a little bit uh, modest like in comparison with uh, how uh, former generations. When we talk about the cultural wars, for example, in the uh, United States during the 70s, uh, so it was uh, very uh, uh, rather violent. So uh, donc, uh, we, we have to uh, uh, think about this period, which was very important. So there, there were always uh, some activism, but the reason why donc, we are uh, struggling and fighting and just uh, doing our job, by the way, uh, is different. I think before, uh, when we are talking about uh, conversation instead of uh, conversation, in fact, as Chris said, the curators were gatekeepers. They were uh, the, uh, um, keeping the treasuries in fine arts temples. But now we open the conversation to other voices, and those voices represent our society. Uh, I think that there are a little bit, a uh, lot of fear think, among uh, the curatorial world because they have the impression that they are uh, losing their power because voice is the power. But when we open uh, the conversation to uh, different voices, uh, other kind of professionals, I'm not talking about us because, well, we are cultural professionals and we are always on stage, by the way. This is a proof. Uh, so that would, what would be interesting is to invite different people donc, within our cultural institutions and who could have the voice, like uh, doctors, like uh, donc, all kinds of scientists, etc., etc. So it will help to enrich the, the uh, interpretation, uh, the display of uh, our collection, of the artists. I think that having much more uh, interdisciplinary, uh, interprofessional process roads okay, in within our team, within our uh, programming, is super important because it's exactly the way how people... Uh, I would add, yeah. we have to work... work. You're, you're anticipating my, my question, uh, my last question, because we only have three mi four, four minutes left, but um, you talked about your role as a leader uh, of an institution. You are three leaders. Um, what, what do you think and what do you recommend to the crowd who work? Uh, most of, uh, I think, most of you guys uh, work in the cultural sector. Uh, what concrete actions, as an individual leader, can you undertake to build this conversation? You have to first begin with asking the right question. Okay. That's number one. 
Number two is, I think you have to have the courage to explore fields which you don't know yet. I mean, the whole idea of the so-called academic specialist is somebody who knows his domain. I'm interested in transgressing your own domain. And then third, there are issues. And one of these issues is, for instance, asking the question, I'm doing this exhibition, I want to do this exhibition, but do I take care of, for instance, all these conditions which we now try to listen to, like ecological conditions? Mm -hmm. Do we need all these new walls? Do we need to bring artworks from faraway uh, countries? Do we need big exhibitions? I mean, these three things, but you know what? These things change, of course. Mm -hmm. If you would ask me the same question 10 years ago, mm -hmm. I would have given a different Yeah, but they don't, they don't change the, by snapping your fingers. They change because people like you make it change. So transgress, invite, uh, and go over the borders, and what would I be would your advice? I would add, I totally agree with both of your uh, propositions, <laughs> um, but I would also add collectiveness. I think it's key today, which, which goes also with inviting people from other worlds and working together rather than my show, my artist, blah, 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 which actually are nobodies, by the way, uh, is better or like, it's, it's not, it's collective work these days. Um, and we see it in different fields, especially here today in this Change Now uh, Summit. Collectiveness makes us stronger, makes it work. Uh, we'll do some mistakes, we'll go and explore things that do not work, and that's not bad, but we'll learn from the others. That's also asking the question, what is a specialist today? I mean, we are talking about user communities, and things are going to change with the Web 3.0. We are going to talk about user communities, and these user communities are going to affect mm. more than ever our work. And that's whether you like it or not. When yeah. you whether you like it or but not. But it's good. Also, yeah, it's good, of course. In so that's the reason why I'm speaking mm -hmm. about the art of whiff. <laughs> oh yes. yeah, uh, the plus, the multiply. Well, you exactly. mentioned. Uh, I think that uh, our because we are uh, not just uh, global or local, but local right now in our 21st century. Okay, because uh, way how we learn things are much more horizontal and less uh, vertical. Uh, so uh, it is important to. Uh, cooperate, co-conceive, to work with uh, those uh, co-concepts, yeah. collaboration, interculturalism, okay, inter-community. So this is a way how we can uh, invent uh, this uh, global uh, century. So we are always much more intelligent when we gather uh, different brands around the table. So I would say for you, just say to the people you meet, uh, associations, etc. How we can be useful for you, and just say yes and open the path, open the adventure. But Natalie, <laughs> you agree we should never, never give up our judgment, right? I I do <laughs> think that a collective judgment uh, is sometimes <laughs> let's debate, judgment exactly. and debate. <laughs> it's gonna as be long the end as of everything is debate. respectful <laughs> and collective. Yes. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you three. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And it was a very good introduction. If if we have Esme Ward, th did we manage to uh, to get back the connection? Because all of uh, all of the great insights that you gave and the and also, oh yeah, Esme, you're here. I hope the connection is better. Um, all the all that you said. Thank you, thank you so much. Can you can you all give a round of applause for our, our three panelists? Thank you. And Natalie concluded with a co-construction and um, and co-building of the purpose of a museum, and that's precisely what you did at the Manchester Museum. So we have. I mean, uh, do you want to uh, to expose to us what, what is the the hell of future for, or even, I mean, whatever you want to say, but uh, you have you yeah. have the stage I for uh, for a few minutes. Okay, I think the echo is still happening. No, it's better. Is it? Okay? Oh, okay, great. So I really want to share how we're transforming to become the museum our city needs. Opening up and reframing how collectively we care and take action to build understanding, 
intimacy and love to our world and each other. It's a truly collective event. So, so home to over four and a half million objects from natural sciences to human cultures, uh, traditionally called encyclopedic, uh, our mission is to build understanding between cultures and a more sustainable world. And we're in the midst of a 15 million pound capital transformation with the new extensions, spaces, galleries, and a host of new spaces, inclusive spaces, from prayer rooms, therapy space, changing places, toilet, co-working hub for charities. It's not the bricks and mortar though that I want to focus on. And actually the conversation earlier was brilliant because so much resonated. I want to talk about the values that drive and shape our work. A commitment to inclusion, greater collaboration and co-production, foregrounding diverse perspectives from co-curation on an epic scale in our new South Asia gallery to an indigenizing the museum program. A commitment to imagination, engaging with innovative ideas and research, bringing people together to tell extraordinary stories and explore big questions. We have an amazing power to convene. The entire top floor of my museum has opened up to become a co-working space for researchers and local educational and environmental charities that share our commitment to social and environmental justice. It's where we do things differently. And then a commitment to care, building an ethics of care. So we're not just caring for collections, but for people, ideas, beliefs, and relationships. And of course, our world. We're the world's first carbon literate museum. And in partnership with the charity, the Carbon Literacy Project, we actually train the UK's museum sector to become more carbon literate, a start, a foundation on which to build. And our environmental action manager works across the museum and the city to build relationships, develop policy, and critically undertake action. We have a new air quality monitoring station just being installed on our new roof and we work with schools across the city on air quality issues uh, outside of their, of their schools. So we're really interested in becoming the museum the city needs. But can we really do that? Do we really know our city well enough? It's why we've embarked on a pilot programme, Local Matters, where staff are trained as social justice researchers, focused on addressing how poverty and disadvantage are understood and responded to within the museum and through its relationships and activities. Within two miles of my museum, over 11,000 children are living in poverty. We have to consider, I believe, what that means for us if we really want to reflect the communities we serve. So when we reopen in February 2023, we will, of course, showcase the best of our historic collections as well as addressing the urgencies of the present day. But more than anything, I think, we hope we'll be closer than ever, for, ever before to being a place where everyone belongs. Thank, thank you so much, Esme. Uh, so it's a, it's a good synopsis of what I want you to uh, to dig deeper and concretely for everyone to know. Because you said you don't want to talk about the brick and mortar, but I think it's essential. Because uh, how do great ideas translate into reality for a museum? Um, so for example, you, uh, so you said you, you put on the top floor um, a co-working space. Uh, for uh, for nonprofits uh, that work in the cultural and, and social sector, how how did this idea come to you? Uh, and as Chris mentioned uh, earlier, how do you ask the right question to, uh, to the city, uh, the, 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 to Mancunians? really wanted to think about a wider process of opening up the museum 
And I had been, um, several years ago, I did a fellowship where I grappled with what museums are really for. And I looked at various projects all, all over the world. And two things, uh, two places really inspired me. The uh, European Centre for Solidarity in Gdansk. And I was interested in their work with NGOs and how they opened up to be a space for them. But actually, mostly a tech, um, uh, a tech organization in Bangalore, in India, where they had turned an entire floor into a space for environmental charities who really used the expertise and everything that that tech um, uh, organization had for their own ends. And I could see the way they were building this ecology. So I started talking. So my museum has done a lot of work. It's very connected to its city, but we started to talk to lots of partners that we felt were fellow travellers who were interested in really um, using the museum more. And we realised we wanted to actually do more than just be a space they came to. We wanted to really have them based with us. They shared our values. They shared our mission. So it started with an extraordinary um, college called Project Inc., who are, work with neurodiverse young people, 16 to 25 year olds, and we trialed it. They be, we became a bit of an HQ for them. Um, and we have just opened and opened up. We have a therapy space there now, partly because sadly, we believe the future of education means we have to take young people's mental health seriously. So we have been, um, I think it's an iterative process we're growing and growing. And in terms of the way we opened up to the environmental sector, we just went to talk to people and said, what do you need? What do you want from us? What could we do for you? And all of them said, we want to be at the heart of your museum. We want to shape the stories you tell. We want to use your collections. We want to draw on your convening power. Um, and the best way it seems to do that to me is just open up, just have them based with you. We get to know each other, they're part of our work, they're curating with us, we're developing ideas together, we're raising funds together, we're redistributing our money. So it, it's, it is about the bricks and mortar in that we are that space, but it's about the how we're working together because we have a shared vision for what Manchester needs to be for the future. And the only way that we're going to navigate this world is to do it together, collectively. Hmm. Um, you, you mentioned the collections because they're you're first and mm. foremost a museum, uh, even if it's a university mm. museum that is quite peculiar if you want to talk about that. Um, but how do you make your collections relevant to society? Um, well, I think uh, we have to be really careful of the assumptions that we make. So we do a lot of work with our collections beyond our building. So we have done everything from um, taking a huge elephant skeleton into the middle of uh, our Piccadilly train station, because this, the story of this elephant is it once walked from Edinburgh to Manchester because it refused to take the train. Um, but we did that to have something that stopped commuters in their tracks, that, that actually we learned so much from how people engaged with this elephant in the middle of the train station, not what you usually expect. Nope. Um, and we really worked with people on what the plight of the Asian elephant was. So it was involved with charities. Um, we actually have collections all over the city. We have small Egyptian shabtis throughout schools all over Manchester. We have um, a peacock in the middle of a restaurant, a South Asian restaurant. We, we just want to liberate those collections and get them out across the city because they will find new meaning and relevance. And we will learn so much from that process. Getting out of the walls. It costs money. Uh, I think it's the, a problem, a general problem for anyone here. Uh, how do you raise funding and, and who can uh, fund all those openness activities? Mm. It does cost money. It's also a choice. Um, so, uh, there, of course, it, 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 everything costs money, um, but the power of collective endeavour. So, uh, so much of what we do is in partnership 
and we work with those partners. So the work that we do, for example, with all of those shatis, those ancient Egyptian um, uh, figures I mentioned in schools, that has got a whole host of funders and people who are behind that, supporting that idea. Um, similarly, we're closed at the moment to the public because we're going through this huge transformation. So we are taking, it's a choice for us to spend our money ensuring that our collections are across the city. And as a university museum, we have a commitment to teaching and research, as you imagine, but also to social responsibility. So we really want to think about where those collections can be at the heart of conversations in the city um, and can actually start to shift some of the narratives um, and some of the expectations there are many stories told in my city and um, we have collections that help tell very different stories, tell stories about air quality, for example, tell stories about um, uh, what inclusivity looks like in the city or migration, having those at the heart of policy conversations within communities, it changes how people engage with our collections. You, you mentioned 11,000 kids uh, participated to, to mm -hmm. um, one of your programs. Do you have other concrete impacts that you had uh, leveraging your museum um, yes, as a, as a tool for impact? Yeah, so um, we, ha we have a, a range really. So I think everything from the, um, so my museum has got the, probably the oldest education service uh, of any museum in the UK. Uh, and previously we would have 35,000 children coming through our museum every, every year. Um, our work off site is growing and growing. So we now are at a point where we have, um, we have uh, currently, uh, 17 shabtis within schools, which uh, equates to, I haven't got the exact figures with me, but I, each of those schools, it is engaged with every single one of those pupils and their families. We're in the, we're in the many, many thousands. Um, but I think, I understand the question about evidence. Um, I suppose there's also something which is, how do you build relationships? And, and so often that evidence is about breadth rather than about depth. So for me, the things I get excited about in relation to things like evidence are the last job we advertised at the museum and who applied and more people locally than ever applied for that job. A 60% increase in our local neighborhood in people applying for that role. That for me is, uh, is a really good sign that we are shifting and we are being more inclusive. Yes, definitely. I mean, I didn't ask for a, a numeric impact, uh, a qualitative impact. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've yeah. you've you've been um, you've been at the at, at the head of this museum for uh, years, and maybe you you've seen and you've, you've inspired uh, other museums to to do so. So that is part of of the impact. But uh, my question is more: Do you measure, and how how do you measure, and what is your advice to the room? Uh, as so uh, measuring your impact, qualitative or quantitative? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a great question. And as you can see from my answer, I, I, yeah. we're grappling with this at the moment. So when I, um, I've been in this role for four years. When I was, um, when I was interviewed, I, w I was asked that question of, you know, when you leave and you, you've done your work, how will you know what difference you've made? And uh, I know that everybody else who was interviewed, uh, I was the only non-museum director, gave great examples of the impact, um, everything from, you know, the number of visitors and financial, you name it. And I remember very distinctly just saying that the museum would be more widely and deeply loved. Um, and so how do we get a sense of it being more yes. widely and deeply loved? And I think that's through the sense of connectedness across the city. It's through our role in the ecology. It's through how the colleagues we work with, the partners we work with, feel supported. It's through the use of those collections. It's through the way that we collectively, as a city, 
really start to understand the difference that we can make together and whether we really are building that understanding between cultures. The fact that we've got 31 people now, all of South Asian heritage co-curating our gallery and that every our, our visitors have shifted so massively. I think those are the things for me that will really mean we make that difference. And in a way, um, I think when we reopen, our visitors will give us that sense of whether we've really started to make this difference. Uh, thank you so much, Esme. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry for the technical issues. I'm sorry to, to you all Me in the too. room. <laughs> uh, and uh, yes, I mean, let's, uh, let's meet in Manchester in February. It's, uh, it's reopening, right? 2023, thank and uh, we'd love to see you there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Esme, for your uh, inspiring talk. Can you give uh, Esme a round of applause, please? Thank you so much. And uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome on stage uh, Caitlin Thuddock. Hi, Caitlin. Sir. Yeah, here, if you want. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much, Caitlin, to uh, be here. You're, you're constantly moving, right? You're, uh, <laughs> in, in conferences all around the world. <laughs> yes. So thank you, uh, thank you for, uh, for being present uh, for Change Now. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good thing that you're concluding this panel, because um, so you're the founder of Key Culture. Yes. Uh, it's a nonprofit helping uh, been giving trainings and and uh, and tools to museum directors uh, to bring in more impact and more sustainability in the way they manage their um, uh, their museums. So you have a whole panel of partners, and you can talk to us in details about uh, about all the all the challenge the uh, challenges that they're that they're facing. What uh, what did you uh, think about everything that you've heard uh, before? Some of the things that were said during the panel session and what Esme was talking about, it was like taking words out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's it's such a beautiful thing to be part of a sector that really has the same vision. Um, you know, one of the reasons I started working in sustainability in culture. First of all, that's my background. I'm a conservator by training. Mm -hmm. But also, it's, it's low-hanging fruit. There's no one in the cultural sector that doesn't want to be sustainable. Um, we all get it. We all have this passion for it. We just need a path. We need the way. And so that's what Key Culture does. What, and why did you decide? Uh, when, when was it? A few years ago? Just, uh, just two, uh, two years yeah, ago. Yeah, two years ago. Yeah. Uh, what was the, the sparkle? Oh gosh. Well, as I mentioned, I'm a conservator by training, and um, you know, I've I've had like the coolest career. I've worked at the Uffizi Gallery. I've done research at the Getty. I worked at the Vatican Museums. I was part of the first team of con of conservators to go down to Rapa Nui and work on the Moai statues. Awesome. And yeah, I mean, I had the best job, but. I love this beautiful planet that we live on. And, you know, standing on the beaches of Rapa Nui, pouring toxic chemicals over the Moai and watching it run into the ground and Great. out into the ocean just churned my stomach. And I wanted to find a way that I could be more responsible in my own day-to-day -day work, and I couldn't find anything. And there was just this need for someone to take a leadership position in helping to transform the sector into a more sustainable one in a holistic and global way. Good, and, and you're doing it through different tools, so trainings, uh, books, so we're going to talk about a specific book uh, right after. Um, and how did you pick the subject uh, that you're going to, uh, of your trainings, for example? Was it regarding the, the needs of your partners and, and clients? Yeah. How, how did you do this? Well, so the program that we run is called Key Futures, and it's a little bit difficult to describe, and I feel that I, I always have to spend like 20 minutes talking to people, explaining what it is, because it's nothing that's ever been done before. And one of the problems that we saw in the cultural sector is that the way sustainability was being approached was in this kind of consultancy model. So, you know, a museum would hire a consultant or a firm or they would bring on an in-house director. But, you know, that 
within of itself is not sustainable because you're just working with the museum director, the facilities manager, maybe the COO, and you make some changes, and that's wonderful, but then you leave. And then what about the conservator in the basement? How does my job change? What about the curator and what they're working on? And so we really wanted to find a way that we could foster cultures of sustainability within organizations to empower people who wanted to be sustainable to have the right education, the right tools, and the right support systems to do that. And then on top of that, of course, the most important part is to have this you know, international holistic approach because sustainability is not just for one person or one museum. And we've heard some phenomenal examples, but we need to pop I those bubbles. I, <laughs> I want to hear those phenomenal <laughs> examples. No, because it's inspiring for, for the crowd, so. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, you know, for me, like the best part about the Key Futures program is that it is international. And I, you know, we were in a session and we were talking about um, climate control, which is a huge thing, of course, in museums. Um, and we had a conservator in Nigeria and a curator in Moscow and a freelance professional in Berlin and a sustainability lead in Hawaii. And they were on a call talking about their issues and how they were approaching it. And that exchange, I mean, that just like, that was everything for me. It was so powerful to see people really coming together and realizing that we all have the same questions and asking those right questions, as Chris said. And so were there, uh, for climate control, was there any solutions uh, go, go coming out of this uh, well, discussions? Or yeah, I mean, the are they all different? Are there. That's the, the depending, problem. Yeah. <laughs> the solutions are there. The problem is, is that we're not implementing them. And we have this thing in the cultural sector, especially in the museum side. And I, I say culture in a very broad sense mm -hmm. of the word. We work with obviously conservators and museums, but also artists and galleries and performing arts centers and insurance companies and vendors and suppliers, you know, the whole, the whole, every stakeholder is involved. Yep. And one of the problems we have is that, you know, we tend to be quite traditional. <laughs> <laughs> we tend to be a little bit slower moving. Um, we were originally exempt from all of the conversations about benchmarking and carbon reporting, so we don't really know what our footprint is. Okay. And then, so we have this kind of situation where no one really wants to take that first leap. And then when people do, they don't talk about it. And it's actually really interesting because we all know what green washing is, but there's this other term, green hushing. And for those of you who are not familiar with green hushing, it's basically not talking about your sustainability initiatives because you're afraid of negative backlash. Mm. And I was on the phone with um, a director of a museum that will remain nameless. They've done phenomenal work. They, over the past five years, have decreased their carbon footprint by 70%. So, yeah. And I, I, when I was hearing about what they were doing, I said, this is phenomenal. I want to write about it. Can I you know, uh, use you as a case study? Can I bring you on to do some trainings? No, 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 no. We it. just, we just, well, not shy. The problem is, is that they accept funds from a fossil fuel company. And so, of course, any time that they say, oh, we're doing sustainability, they get all of this negative backlash. But, you know, the, the way that we can address this is by just being transparent about it. The reason that museums have to accept money, well, in this case, have to, well, <laughs> accept, do accept money from places like fossil fuel companies is that we are an economically unsustainable sector. And not many museums have the opportunity to be able to spend, you know, 15 million pounds yeah. on a project, which Amazing, amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's a huge yeah. budget. Yeah. But and it's part of, the, of a university, that's why. Exactly. Uh, but most museums don't have that budget. Most cultural institutions don't have that budget. And actually, you know, this is why it's so important that we're working collectively, because we can learn so much from museums that have to do with less resources, like the National Museum of Lagos in Nigeria, which doesn't have climate control, and they're still managing their collections just fine. Okay. Wow, that, I could go that, on. That, <laughs> must be a, that must be a challenge, though. Um, uh, among all the uh, all the challenges that uh, your uh, partners are facing, is uh, citizen engagement one of those? And uh, and how do you tackle it? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we heard from from the panelists and also from Esme about some of the phenomenal opportunities that the cultural sector has. And this is why I'm so thrilled that you guys have invited us to be part of the conversation here, because it's often overlooked. I mean, 
you know, you can, you can put facts and figures at people all day long. You can put science in front of people all day long. But what culture can do is create that emotional, personal connection that can drive real change, that can drive that societal paradigm shift that we need. And so it's so exciting to see you know, art being represented here and museums, because this is exactly what we have the power to do, is to educate and engage our audiences about sustainability and issues that are local, issues that are global, and why they should care. The trick here is that we also need to be practicing what we're preaching. Yes. So we need to be sustainable as a sector in order to be effective advocates for sustainability. That's for sure. Uh, and, and you, specifically on, on, on this subject, you published a book, because what you're doing, you, you're doing, you're doing uh, <laughs> training, uh, uh, trainings, but also you're publishing books. It's open sourced, it's, yes. like it's free, it's online for any museum to, uh, to download and, and, uh, and read. And, and one specifically uh, of these four books uh, is about uh, social sustainability. Yes. What do you mean by that? And give us a, a little hint of what's inside. That's a good question. So, um, you know, social sustainability has a lot of different terms. It's obviously one of the pillars, the three pillars of sustainability. And, you know, you can call it intersectional activism. You can call it um, decolonization. You can call it inclusivity, uh, accessibility, diversity equity, all of these things, <laughs> equality, equity. Um, so there's a lot of different aspects to it. But this is really, this is fundamental. This is core to what culture does. You know, we are here, as Esme said, to serve our communities. We're here to help support what the needs are of our audiences. And, you know, s once again, social sustainability is not just about the messages that we're sending out, but about our own practices. Yeah. If you look at the conservation sector in the world, 80% women, probably 70% of that is white. It's really not a very accessible or inclusive sector. And um, it's amazing to see the work that is being done yep. towards that. But it's also about you know museums, as we were talking about earlier in the, the panel, um, Natalie said, you know, conservation versus conversation. And that so resonated with me as a conservator, because traditionally museums were there to house collections. But now we have to be places for dialogue. We're mm -hmm. no longer places that just tell people one side of history. So decolonizing our exhibitions, it's about telling history from all sides looking at you know, the way that we're uh, inter interacting with communities from where these objects came. And there's a really beautiful example from the Bishop Museum in Hawaii, which yep. is part of our Key Futures program. Um, they were doing an exhibition about structural racism in Hawaii. And obviously, there's a lot of history there. And they were putting up pictures of, um, of native Hawaiians. And one of the curators said, wait a second, we, we don't have permission to show these. Like, you know, these people are obviously um, passed on, but maybe we should talk to the community. So they reached out to the, to the indigenous Hawaiian community and said, you know, we're doing this exhibition. Can we talk to you about your ancestors? Can we, is it okay with you if we display these, these photos? And it was such a beautiful project because, of course, the curation took on a whole new form. And they engaged with a community that had been previously ostracized. It was, you know, Bishop Museum is a colonial museum, and it was very much apart from from the local indigenous community. And this was just a beautiful example of bridging that gap and creating a relationship that will last forever. We, we talked about the purpose of an yeah. institution, and I guess there are as many purposes as uh, directors of museums <laughs> in the world. Um, what is yours uh, as, a, as, a cu as a conservator, <laughs> as a curator? Um, and uh, and what, are, what are the most interesting that you've that you've come across uh, in your uh, in with key culture. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm no longer a practicing conservator, yes. unfortunately. Um, I mean, my mission, you know, I want to help position culture as leaders for sustainability. I think we have a unique place in this discussion, and that's op often overlooked. And I think that, um, you know, help make the cultural sector more sustainable. I mean, for me, when I was a conservator and I wanted to be more sustainable, I felt completely alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was quite a few years ago. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I was the only person who was asking these questions. I was, you know, I had nicknames. People would tease me. I was glove girl. I was sustainability buddy. I had, like, I mean, it was ridiculous. But... I felt that I didn't have the power, I didn't have the resources, I didn't have the knowledge, it wasn't part of my education, I couldn't find anything, um, and I wanted to make sure that I was the last person who had to feel like that. 
I want every single person within the cultural sector, and actually every single person everywhere, who wants to be able to, who wants to do something, to be able to do it. I want to provide them with that support system, with that network of like-minded individuals. I want them to be able to feel that they have the knowledge to ask the questions, mm -hmm. that they have the, you know, the individual agency to be a part of these conversations, even if they are just a conservator. Yes, just a conservator, or or the little intern. Uh, oh, the intern. Yeah, in the in the sustainable service, yeah. wants to move the needle. Absolutely, and I think we all have the power to do that. I mean, I have my my um, one of my co-directors on social sustainability um, is a woman named Pia Edqvist, and she's hi Pia. Um, <laughs> she is a conservator at in Oslo, and when she started, she was she's an archaeological yeah. conservator. She does bench work, but she started asking these questions about social sustainability, and you know they'd get an artifact in, and she'd say, well, where does this come from? What is its history? How are we describing this to our to our audience are we talking about this and you know and then you know little by little people started going to her for okay what questions do we need to be asking and she ended up writing the uh, social sustainability policy for her museum a conservator I mean we all have that power and it's just you know about standing up and asking those questions <laughs> <laughs> you you mentioned that uh, you work in a network you also work in a in a, on another in another network uh, called the ICOM, yes. uh, which is quite <laughs> polemic because they're trying to redefine the role of a museum. Yes, um, and it's a constant online uh, debate. I invite everyone to go on the museum definition page on the ICOM. It's quite <laughs> funny. It looks like a Wikipedia where uh, every year it's updated. And but I, I like it. It's a debate. It's a debate. And you're part open process. Exactly. Yes. And you're part of a working group on yes. sustainability. Yes. Um, I hear it's a lot of words and conversations. <laughs> How do we turn those global uh, players like the ICOM into doers? Whew, that's a great question um, and a tricky one, I think. Um, you know, ICOM is a huge international organization. And at the heart of what they do, they are there as a professional museum network and body. And of course, the big thing is this museum definition, which I'm very pleased to say all of the definitions that are up for debate have sustainability as a component. Thank you to um, my colleagues um, at the working group and at the museum definition. But you know, it's it's really, I think what it's really about is trying to is is integrating sustainability into every conversation and into every job. And this is really the foundation of what I see. You know, I always compare sustain sustainability as a lens. It's yeah. a way to see the world. It's a new mindset. And when you're looking like for example at ICOM, well, sustainability is a working group. No, 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 no. Sustainability needs to be integrated into every single aspect of the entire organization. Similarly to how it needs to be integrated into every single person's job within a museum. I think this is one of the biggest hurdles we have right now in the cultural sector is that people feel like they don't have time for it. Oh. I'm like, really? You don't have time to survive? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, but no, it's it's you know we are overworked. We're underpaid. We've got so much going on. Sustainability is so <laughs> overwhelming. Where do we get started? I've got you know this exhibition deadline. I've got this and that. The Key Futures program, you know, it's one hour a week, and then the idea is that that will start planting that seed and continuing to water it because we all need to see how sustainability is related to everything that we do, every single conversation we have, every aspect of our job. And once we can start seeing that, these national organizations will also, yeah. you know, get on board with it. So I think that it's about you know, national organizations have a huge role to play in advocating for this and supporting their members to be doers. But I think it, it does start with us and putting on those glasses and starting to see how different aspects of our job relate to sustainability in a large sense in a holistic way. Yeah, so let's 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 all lobby yes. <laughs> from <laughs> our own place to those global institutions like the ICOM or the, 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 gra the greatest ones yeah. uh, as, as doers ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. What, what, is, what is the conclusive word that you want to, to give to, uh, to our audience? Oh, conclusive word. Um, you're not alone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, this, this obviously this conference has, you know, 
has shown that. And I think that it's so important, you know, one of the things that we we're talking about on the panel as well is this idea of co-creation. Yep. Um, we do not have to know everything. I will be the first person to tell you that I don't know everything about sustainability. You come to me and ask me a question, I don't know, but let's go find the answer. You don't have to be an expert in order to take that next step or that first step. It's about asking the questions. It's about finding support systems and partners. It's about being part of that conversation. And collaborative. Collaborative. As said. Co-creation, yes. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>